It was a dark and gloomy day on Wall Street as the market had sold off into a very specific key level. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about what happens if selling continues past this key level. And by past this key level, I'm talking about the expected move. I've been getting a lot of questions on it. So we're going to discuss that in today's market brief. Let's go ahead and get into today's show. Alrighty, everybody, welcome back. We're just taking a look at the heat map. Yep, right across the board, no news there. Some big moves in the big mega cap stocks. Amazon was down around almost 4%, Microsoft down around three, Apple down big two, financials were down. Everything was really in the red today, minus some energy names held up quite well. Um, what took place in the bond market? Well, bonds, the 10 year yield got back above three. So you can see here it is sitting at 3.03%. And well, tech doesn't like when the yields rise like that, especially at a rapid rate. You can see here the 10 and two curve, it's still inverted and the 10 year and three month remains not inverted, but still flat as a pancake. Flat as a buttery pancake with syrup all over it. So what's keeping the market on edge? Well, we have right now the Fed watch tool up. We're deciding between a 50 basis point or a 75 basis point rate hike. And you can see it's basically 50-50 across the board. The 75 basis point hike is kind of increasing as the um, the market, it seems to be pricing in less rate cuts moving forward. So we'll continue to monitor that. Many things are happening also as far as narratives and news take place, right? We had the European stock hit its lowest in nearly a month and it's looming that energy crisis. We have the Bundesbank sees more, pre, uh, more wage pressure as German inflation reaches near 10%. Absolutely crazy. And then we also have some news. Saudi Arabia warns of OPEC plus cuts. Oil production, if prices continue to fall um, just recently for Ford, um, Ford announced that uh, it's it's looking to axe 3,000 workers as it reshapes um, its operations uh, for the new electric cars. And obviously, the stock price did not fare too well on that news, down 5% on the day. This is all coming on the back of a rising dollar, which we discussed the correlation between the dollar and other risk assets. Okay, the dollar is perpetuating very strongly to the upside. It actually had its best week that it hasn't seen since like uh, 2020. Um, it was like up 2%, which is a large move in the currency market. But you can see here, the S&P 500 is finally feeling it, right? So is the dollar top in? Well, that's to be determined at this particular point in time. But as it stands right now, it doesn't look like it. And when the dollar goes up, what happens to the euro? The euro falls below parity again, something to note here. Um, because this is like a this is what's taking place here is global people okay it's not just the united states this is global okay but many investors you know believe that it was to be short-lived as we saw that little bounce um, because europe faces an energy crisis and rising odds of a recession go figure right same probably here with the u.s the dollar index as we already previously m mentioned it's gained 2.2 percent last week it's best weekly gain since march 2020 as the wall street journal reported okay but we knew this right so you can try to trade off news and narratives as much as you can but price action and various tools that we use was deter letting us know that hey it's time to let your foot off the gas a little bit to determine where risk is relative to reward and it does not take long for risk to take effect Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, risk, it happens, you know, slow and then bam, all at once. You can see here we cross below that zero line measuring and mapping the difference between growth and value. And now we're starting to feel the pressures there. Now, this doesn't tell you how far it's going to fall. It can very well just turn back around, but we're going to talk about expected moves momentarily. Not only do we have that, but we also talked about the negative divergence building in the McClellan oscillator. We talked about the sailor to shift tool, which actually still hasn't produced a sell signal at this given time because the, the price action hasn't got below the low of the prior week. However, you know, some people front run this signal. It's totally fine. So we'll continue to monitor that, see what develops. Also to note, we had negative divergences building here in the NIMOT um, looking compared to the New York Stock Exchange. But one of the bigger ones that I'm watching here is a change in trend, meaning that are we going to have the parabolic star in the next couple of days start clicking back above forming potentially the start of a bigger downtrend despite maybe even seeing some bounces to the upside and as you can see here when it clicked last time bam to the downside when it clicked here bam to the downside and then when it clicks up right boom to the upside so we'll continue to monitor that see how that develops as well um, another indicator that we were watching was the divergence that was building in bonds now i'm not I, i'm reiterating these so you you're aware of these indicators that we use they're not just 
to find bearish things. They're also to find bullish things as well, which we've stated on all those prior indicators. Okay, but here's HYG, right? The bond market, the smart money versus the dumb money over here. You can see it forms positive divergences, positive divergences, right? What, what, I'm, what am I talking about here? Well, HYG put in a higher low. Meanwhile, the SPY, the dumb money put in a lower low. And I know the people that trade SPY, they're not, it's not just dumb money, but the bond market tends to be the more intelligent money, like big dollars, okay? Well, on a negative divergence, it built a lower low, a lower high giving us, you know, indication as the SPY was putting in a higher high that's saying that, hey, you know, this could very well be potentially topping out. And for the people that say, well, why don't you show us ahead of time? This was shown and it was also posted on my Twitter. If you don't follow me there, you can follow me there. Okay, what else do we got going on in the markets? Well, if we take a look at the safety ratios, you can see here, right, you know, from the top going down, they're all safety trades, gold relative to SPY, these are relative performance, XLU, so utilities, consumer staples, TLT defensive sector, and healthcare, you can see they're all starting to turn back up slightly, right? The XLP recently crossed above its 50 period EMA, XLU is still cranking up there, gold is starting to turn back around there too, um, but these are all relative strength, remember, okay, so it, it doesn't mean that they both can't fall, it just means one falls less than the other if they both fall. Okay, now let's get into a little bit more interesting stuff that took place today. Now, I don't have the chart of the NASDAQ composite up, but it did see a pretty significant down day and it was on decreasing volume. Okay, so that's one thing that I want to say that's kind of a little odd um, overall, but we're going to hop into the expected move. So S&P 500, we're going to look at the SPY as the proxy. It tagged the lower expected move today and traded around it. It wasn't just the SPY. We had the Qs and the IWM do the same thing. Okay, this is day one of the week. What is the expected move? Okay. The expected move, this is important for people that might not understand this. The expected move is forward looking risk. Okay. It is what the options market is pricing in as potential risk or, you know, a range of risk. Okay. So we pulled this on Friday, basically close a business and it gives us this range. All right. So 430 to the upside, more specifically, it's 430 and 42 cents. And then you have 413 and 86 cents to the downside. Well, this is day one and we actually closed beneath that lower expected move. And that is, you know, a very, you get, if it's on the edge, you need to be also very wary and on the edge as well. Okay. So this is, we talked about this on prior episodes. This is where you typically cover Okay, not necessarily go long. Okay, you can get lucky and go long, but understand after today's episode, you might be a little bit more wary on that. Okay, and I'll, I'll get into it. Now, if we zoom in even closer to say a one minute time frame, you can see here, okay, this is one minute for the day. You can see we sold off, we bounced up, and bam, then we basically just stuck around that expected move for the remainder of the day, not closing too far off from it, okay? So what happens here, yeah, people ask, is this support and resistance? No, it's not support or resistance. Why is it so important then? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna get into that momentarily, okay? But you gotta understand what it is, why, why we track it, uh, most importantly for first, and then what we found today that was very, very, very interesting. So now I wanna point out here, we're gonna look at the SPX to really go over this. Why the SPX? Well, this is the big bigger product, right? This is one that we're going to check. It's very liquid and it tends to be a little bit more accurate than lower liquidity, um, you know, ETFs and or individual equity. So this is the big, the big dog product that we want to keep an eye on. Now, the expected move for the S&P 500, the, uh, using the SPX as the proxy was 8261 on Friday, right? And we made that move today getting outside of it, right? We had the lower edge and the higher edge of the expected moves priced in for the week. Now, why is this so important? What happens if we start getting out of this? Okay, the equation, okay, for this huge product, okay, is built off of the volume and the open interest. All right, so we're looking at 14 strikes at the S&P 500. This is just using TradingView. Okay, so you see volume column, open interest, open interest volume. So when you look down here, and this is not a small product, Okay, like we already stated, it's not a small product, it's a huge product, open interest and volume. Look at all the contracts that are taking place here within just 14, looking at 14 different strikes. Okay, and then you look at the prices, the bid and ask that they're selling at, the bid and ask that they're selling at, it's a lot of money. And this isn't, like I said, this isn't even, and this is all used to calculate these expected moves. Okay, but this isn't all the strikes, right? If we look at all the strikes, I'd have to scroll a lot further, but you can see it gets more expensive, obviously, 
when we go up here, right, it gets more expensive. You can see, you know, 1200 right there. That was um, open interest, right? And you're looking at 125, 130 as far as the price goes. And this is rough, rough estimates. But as you go down the list here, you can see also it gets more pricey too. And then you could see some bigger contract size down there towards the bottom. Now you might look at this and be like, it's only 3000 contracts. Yeah, okay, but it's also, extremely expensive all right so we're talking big money playing here just if i told pull out one the 4200 strike this right here is about a half million dollars in trading volume in between open interest and volume today okay so we're talking large money we're talking millions sometimes even billions of dollars trading so when you look at a weekly expected move you're talking a billion dollars all right we'll call it a billion dollars but if you look at the spx this weekly expected move is the reason why it's so important is because there's so much money on the line. So what happens if we get outside of what they depicted as far as risk goes? Um, well, things have to change. All right. What do I mean? Things have to change. Well, let's talk about that. So let's use a blank slate here to really walk you through what it might look like. So we have the upper edge of the weekly expected move. This is the higher. And then we have the lower edge down here. We know a lot of money goes into pricing this risk. Um, and, and, and we're going to discuss what happens if price continues to sell really further outside of it, what can happen. Now we've talked about it before where hedging ha activities has to take place, but what does it actually look, look like if we do get in there? Well, you can simply, and, and by the way, we've discussed many times, if it gets outside of it, right, gamma squeezes can happen. And that's to the upside or the downside. Remember, this is risk and risk is both, you know, positive and negative, right? It could be plus or minus. Okay. So as it stands right now, I'll draw those back. As it stands right now, we are right here, just at that lower level of the expected move, okay? So we're at the lower level of the expected move. What would it look like if price starts getting out here? So imagine if you know, you're know you selling puts, all right? If you're selling puts and price continues to go down, okay? So the lower we go in price, right? The more positive that obviously Delta gets, all right? So what would firms be forced to do? Well, they're going to offset that risk. How do they offset it? They do it by negative delta. All right, but where do they get the negative delta from? It's typically by selling um, S&P 500 futures, okay? So what happens here is as price continues down and forces firms to start hedging more, selling, right? Selling, but gets more selling, but gets more selling, causing a squeeze to the downside. And the same thing goes to the upside, you know, if, if we're looking at the breaking the upside of the weekly expected move. Okay, so that's why it's so important to pay attention to these weekly levels, right? That's why we talk about them so frequently. Okay, now if I go back and I look here at the weekly expected move, but on the shorter time frame, look at you, you can see here we're just we're right there, right on the edge. So what would it might look like if we start breaking down further? Well, 41250 held up here as a level of support. So if we start breaking further past 41250, say tomorrow, well, guess what? That could very well force firms to start hedging dynamic hedging kicks in okay to offset that and what would that look like basically how would we know if that's taking place we'll pay attention to volume especially just not like on a minute time frame but if volume all of a sudden just starts going boom 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 that is big money hedging okay that is big big money stepping into play and that could really force the project the price further. Now that's not what I'm predicting to have happen. Most of the times as we stand here, just right here on this lower edge, or even if it happens on the upper edge, all right, typically this is obviously the happy place. So what we'll probably see tomorrow, all right, what we'll probably end up seeing is probably a lackluster day, right? Because why? Because we're already in the happy place. So it's uh, what a firm's going to do, all right? That, you know, that, there's not going to be much volume traded because we're right here. It's, you know, risk is totally fine. But if we start breaking down, okay, then volume might pick up. Okay, that might be the case. So this right now, the market that we're in, you got to be on edge because of where we are on edge. All right. And if we start breaking down further, watch the volume because if volume picks up, more selling begets more selling. All right. But as it stands right now, we're in a happy place. So I wouldn't be surprised to see price just doodle around here until we see some sort of economic drop. And we have some economic data coming out tomorrow and we have Jay Powell talking on Friday. So there can very well be um, instances where we can see um, big shakeups. Now, this is where it gets crazy to me. All right. This is where it gets a little bit more crazy. All right. We already discussed kind of what, you know, what it looks like, why it happens, et cetera, et cetera. It's not support or resistance. Big money's on the line, blah, da, 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 da. The reason why I find this to be so important and pivotal at this moment is because of this. All right. This is the S&P 500 weekly expected move. 
the dashed lines. Now, the weekly expected move, as we've already previously stated, was 82.61. That was given on Friday towards the close of business, okay, a little bit after. The expected move after today's complete trading day, it's at 81.96. It barely budged. What does that mean? It means volatility, even after hitting its lower expected move, it is still ex incredibly high, all right, after already moving that type of move. This is the type of setups that can take us to a two sigma move, bringing us down to around 4,050. That would be a two sigma, two standard deviation move, which is more than possible, okay? So we need to see if this is going to settle off, but also remind, remember, it's plus or minus. Plus or minus means what? It means we can have a snapback right, right up to 42, or 42, you know, and some change. That is much, that is incredibly, incredibly possible, okay? Given, given the current context of the market. And it would have to be some sort of probably news-driven event that can drive us there. Okay, so as it stands right now, we are just in an incredible, incredibly volatile time period. If you miss this move, these are not the moves that you want to make rash judgments right into, okay? And if you were short and you were prepared for this move, all right, you need to, for example, if you're short, these are the levels that you have to consider taking some off the table. By some, I mean covering some of your shorts, all right? Because we're there, yeah, I can drop further, but that's why you cover some. Is this where you go long? Eh, maybe, maybe. It depends on your strategy. It depends on your length of time. As it stands right now, that was a bearish move on some big volume. That was a bearish move on some eh, nicer size volume too, relative to the previous run up. So these are two distribution days back to back. When we get four to five distribution days, watch out. If you remember my videos over here, I was talking about boom, boom, you know, all these like big increases of volume, or maybe it was over here more. I can't, I can't remember where the video was, but I even put it on the thumbnail that distribution days were building and it got to like four or five. And that's where, you know, that's where it gets a little bit more like, Hey, you know, buckle up. It, it can get quite wild. Okay. So we're at two right now here. And also on the NASDAQ composite, we're at two as well. Okay, we'll, we'll continue to move on, um, you know, past this phase. Let's look at the 65-minute time frame. You can see here we tagged the lower trend line and the lower week, uh, weekly expected move. Um, RSI on the 65-minute time frame is getting a little bit burnt, all right, as we're trading right around this level. So tomorrow, what can we expect? I don't know, probably some doodling around if it stays within its happy place because we're not going to see much volume most likely. I, I mean, that's what I would imagine. Can I be can I be wrong? Yeah, sure. I obviously can be wrong. None of this is 100% accurate, right? We're dealing with probabilities and statistical analysis that we've seen past happen. Okay, we have a, we're below a five-day moving average, and it is clearly declining. When I say don't short in the hole, people ask, oh, well, why not? Why, why not play the breakdown gap? Well, just because it gives a different risk to reward. So if I were to go short here, all right, where would be a good stop loss? Well, the stop loss would be, have to be, you know, up here. I, you know, but if it's if it's right here, I mean, okay, chances are we can get stopped out quite easily, right? Um, so when I say you know you know don't shorten the hole or be patient, what I would like to see is yeah maybe a pop back up, you know maybe fill this gap, you know re tag that declining five day moving average and see it actually hold his resistance, and then you can you know short if it starts breaking down or you know for example if it looks something like this, bam yep it came down up and then tries to get back above and then you short down through this right here boom to the downside as the five day moving average starts clicking back down like that okay it gives you by by looking at it like that it gives you less risk to potentially more downside reward it's all about measuring and mapping your risk relative to your reward and what we've been talking about on this rise up right is the risk or sorry the reward was minimizing on the upside and maximizing more onto the downside and all of a sudden out of nowhere what if you weren't prepared it maybe took you off guard um, but it shouldn't right we moved within the weekly expected move and it came quick and fast let's take a look at the cues cues hit the lower edge of the weekly expected move right it's below that five day moving average so what would i like to see well most likely you know it'll be a calm day but if it starts picking back up look at the gap fill maybe do something like that and start shorting back through it if the five day moving average holds right you got to understand we still have a large expected move so you can't even you can't rule out it coming right back to the top all right that would be all as as expected okay given the current move um, that we just recently saw in within the weekly expected move and in the S&P 500's new expected move, which is pretty much, you know, very similar, okay? Now, like I said, previously stated, it works with the Qs too, right? If it starts breaking down further, you know, 
be careful. It has, you know, it be very careful. If it gets to the IWM um, beneath the five-day moving average, we're starting to see some, you know, wicked sell side activity, putting in a subtle positive divergence right here within price. So yeah, we'll probably get some sort of relief rally at some point. But remember, once we hit these edges, right? They can typically doodle around there for quite some time. So even if we start moving up, everyone's going to go. Ooh, we're going back up to the top. But don't be surprised if we go snap right back down to the lower edge, okay? Right back to the happy place, okay? That's more, more than possible. We got to walk through if-then statements here. We're below a declining five-day moving average. When do you get bullish? Well, when the five-day moving average is more neutral to start turning up, okay? So if it goes like this, boom, 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 and then you could buy right through there and start playing to the upside, all right? That's, that's what that would look like, okay? So don't be rushing, making quick judgment calls um, you know, in the midst of, you know, obviously increasing volatility. That's all I got for you on today's episode, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful day. If you're still sticking around and you want to be part of the swing trade community, come check it out. Um, the figuring out money, I guess, Patreon, it's nine bucks a month. Uh, keep in mind it's August 22nd. Uh, um, if you buy, if you do the $9 a month, Patreon charges the first of every month. So you'd have to give, do $9 now and $9 then. So you might as well wait till the first of next month to join, or you can do annually and you just get a 16% discount on top of that. It ends up being like seven bucks a month, 90 US dollars, and you get access to all this stuff. And uh, just random announcements, my watch list every week, trade ideas, weekly expected moves where I track like 40 products or so. And then um, I started including the zones. I'm not going to discuss what that is right now. Um, and then you get access to the trading community. And I'll be honest, actually, there's some traders and they're now posting some really good setups. So uh, I'm enjoying it quite a bit there. All right, everybody. See you later.